You're listening to Cross Rhythms Plymouth 96.3 FM. And uh, this is Life Stories. To be honest with you folks, this is my favourite show I get to uh, do here on the station. It's an opportunity to speak with someone about their life, about their faith, about what's important to them and uh, and all those kind of subjects. So uh, I've got the pleasure and privilege of being joined in the studio today by Sarah Chaplin. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Dave. Great to have you here. This has been uh, a little while in the making. It's uh, it's brilliant to have you uh, here finally in the studio. It's and, great uh, to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I know you've have travelled up from uh, deepest, darkest Cornwall. <laughs> to yeah, be they let today. me across the Tamar. Yeah, exactly. They did. And uh, and we're obviously going to talk about your life, uh, your life story. And you kind of sent me an email with various different things we can cover. So we'll get into lots of different things. But as we do with these interviews, if you could start from the beginning, what was life like for you growing up? Where did you grow up? Um, and what was life like for you uh, at the start, really? OK, I was born in Wales in a town called Neath in South Wales, born to lovely uh, parents. And I've also got a younger sister. So I've lived most of my life in Wales. Uh, we moved to Cornwall 17 years ago. Right. But as a child, uh, I grew up in a really happy home. Hmm. Uh, lovely uh, Christian parents, good um, values and uh, morals and a real happy, um, encouraging environment. I, I guess the, um, the early situation that we all had to deal with was uh, the fact that I was born with one hand. So mm. that was an interesting uh, twist to things around the time of my birth and especially my early years and, and growing yeah. up as a child, I guess. But um, that's turned out really well in the long run. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, you know, at the time when things happen in life, there's always a few questions, isn't there? How, how will this be and why why do things like this happen? And yeah. So, yeah, that was the, the early start of um, of my life there in Wales. What? So with that very unique situation that, that you faced, mm. um, what was your kind of perception of it? Because I imagine when you grow up with any kind of thing like that yeah. that's just your reality as a child you don't know any different you don't know what it's like to be uh, in any other body effectively but do you yeah. remember what your sort of parents response to that whole situation was and when did you start to become aware that that wasn't the same thing for everyone else I think I probably became aware when I was a toddler you know two or three years of age you really become aware of uh, being different to everyone around you yeah. and doing things differently. Uh, I think for my parents on the day that I was born, it was a terrible shock because I was mm. born um, in the late 1960s where there was no scans, so there was no prior warning that right. there was a problem. Um, whereas scans uh, now pick up on, on, on situations and you can prepare yourself somewhat, mm. um, but there was no preparation, there was a big shock. and. Um, of course, in the 50s, there was the whole situation with the thalidomide, um, anti-morning sickness drug, which yeah. had caused some deformities. So there was also um, some confusion as to why this might have happened. My mum didn't take medication, so right. we know that that wasn't a cause. But why do things like this happen? And and how would it be for this little child? So yeah, I, you know, I can remember in my school days, just feeling different to everyone else but also navigating my own way through mm. um, and then I think into the teenage years you deal with the self-consciousness as, te as teenage girls do what does the mirror say does that define yeah, me of course I'm living in an imperfect body and then you know I think a turning point would have been when I found my own personal faith right, uh, right. As, a, as a 12 year old that was massively a turning point where I began to realise that God loved me actually just the way I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even that there was a bigger picture here that maybe he he allowed it to happen, permitted it to happen, even wanted it to happen. And I began to get a whole lot more peace of mind about that. Amazing. Um, yeah. That's an amazing place to come to even at the age of 12, you know, still quite a young age. Yeah. We're going to stop for some music now and pick up the conversation uh, with Sarah about, you know, what it was that, that drew you to faith, how mm. that became real for yourself from, as you said, you know, you grew up where those values and it was Christian home, but what mm. made it personal for you? We're going to talk more with Sarah uh, right after this. 
You're listening to Cross Rhythms Plymouth, 96.3 FM, and online at crossrhythms.co.uk slash Plymouth. And also, uh, this is Life Stories. We're filming this interview uh, for YouTube. It'll be up on our YouTube channel. Uh, we're Cross Rhythms Plymouth or at CR Plymouth on YouTube. And uh, we'll put sections out on Facebook and Twitter as well. Uh, I'm joined by Sarah Chaplin. Uh, this is the second part of the interview. And uh, Sarah, you mentioned in that first part that... Uh, in many ways a very happy upbringing a uh, great family mm. uh, great parents and a, a kind of Christian home where faith was prevalent uh, but uh, your situation was that you were born with one hand at a time when your parents had no prior knowledge through scans or anything to that so a, mm. a shock for them something you had to come to terms with and you mentioned very briefly towards the end of that first section that coming to faith for yourself was a huge way of helping you deal with that and I suppose process life in general so tell us about your coming to faith how did that come about what was it that made it meaningful more than just your parents faith yeah sure um being brought up in a christian family i've been to church uh, even before i was born right <laughs> so right through my childhood um and we used to go to sunday school uh, sunday school was really popular back in the day and it was on a sunday afternoon and i remember one particular sunday it was uh, a january afternoon and i remember really a, a special moment when both my sister and i she was nine i was 12 we both um, became Christians and, and gave our lives to Jesus. It was, we, we were challenged about um, if we were ready to, to make that step to have personal faith. I could see the life that my parents were living and I know that their faith wasn't sufficient to just keep carrying me. I needed sure. to make that personal decision for myself. Um, and um, I, I know that going to church wasn't enough to do it. I know that praying wasn't enough to do it, although all of those things were really important. I needed to make that personal step. And yeah, it was one Sunday afternoon and I'll never forget that day. And I can honestly say um, I've never really looked back in, in, in that being the integral thing for the whole of my life and the, and the journey it yeah, really yeah, yeah. has. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned in that first section that that helped you come to terms with having one arm you mm. know being different to other people in your school and all those kinds of things um are you able to tell us more about that what was it that really kind of underpinned that that gave you a kind of strength to you know get past some of those insecurities that in a sense we all have yeah and that were maybe made different for for your situation yeah um as a christian i i really love the bible yeah i really love god's word because i really uh, i find that in god's word the bible there's an answer for everything and there is truth for every situation and i can really remember especially as a 12 13 14 15 year old uh, youngster um relying on what god said about me mm. rather than what everyone else might have thought yeah, yeah. Um, you know I'm familiar with walking down the street and people glancing at my arm and thinking right. "Ooh, what's happened there you know um, I'm conscious of looking different to everyone else but what does God really think about me mm. and Psalm 139 I'm sure it is in in the Bible says about um, that when I was knit together in my mother's womb he saw me and he knew me and he loved me and uh, he, he was watching over me in that in that secret place, in that private place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, God was there. And for me, um, that's put everything in perspective that God sees and knows and cares. Yeah. And he was there in those moments. You know, it doesn't matter what our beginnings were. When we have God in the center of our life, we know the end of the story is a yeah. really positive one. Yeah, that's so good. And I suppose as well, like for any of us, having a strong perspective on who we really are how god really sees us our mm. value as it truly is mm. compared to what other people think is vital yeah. and in some ways i suppose you were able to find that yeah. through your unique situation uh, yeah in that way through that lens in that sense. exactly and there are so many voices aren't there yeah. that would try and define who we are totally. or, or who we should be especially in this modern era of of social media social media is fantastic in so many ways it keeps us all connected but it even those things should never really define who we are or mm. what we should be or what we're not ultimately what i think freed my life up completely was just believing and trusting in what god sees about me his value of me yeah, 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 that's amazing. Because it is, uh, you know, our, our bodies, our physical appearance, as you say, are going on a bit of a tangent, but to do with social media. Yeah. Um, you know, historically, I suppose society would be aware that that was a big thing for girls, for women, for young girls. Yeah. 
nowadays increasingly for men as well just living up to this image stereotype yeah. that we should look like we should look mm. you know cut in this particular way mm -hmm. in this particular appearance mm -hmm. and that's tyranny for all of us really yeah. it doesn't matter if you were born with one hand born with two hands yeah. however we were born we're, we're constantly fed in the world to compare yeah. and to compare negatively to other people aren't we in that yeah. sense exactly and if we compare we either feel more than or we'll feel less than and yeah. i think there's more of a tendency to feel less than yeah um you know um i posted a selfie earlier on of myself and my friend having a coffee uh, we are compelled to, to to give a perception as well sometimes of how things are but you know god really knows our hearts yeah he really knows how we tick he, he created us. He knows us better than anyone. And so we have nothing to fear. We've mm. got nothing to a attain or live up to. Yeah, yeah. Um, just believing his love for us. Yeah. yeah. And there's real beauty in our uniqueness in, in how we were created. As you say, that, that verse that we're knit together uniquely. And, and that's something that we could all do with being more aware of. Well, we're yeah. going to stop for some more music. Talk more about your life because uh, obviously those were the early days. But You've been into all kinds of different things over yeah. in other countries, involved in different work. Uh, we're going to touch on some of that after this. You're listening to Life Stories here on Cross Rhythms Plymouth. If you just tuned in, well, you're going to have to catch up, uh, to be honest with you. You will be able to check this out on crossrhythms.co.uk slash Plymouth. Go to listen again uh, or on YouTube as well. I'm in conversation with Sarah Chaplin. And uh, Sarah, we've, we've kind of touched on your early years growing up. How did things develop for you from sort of teenage years and beyond and, and sort of careers and things like that? What did you, uh, what did you head towards uh, as you were growing older? Um, I wanted to be a doctor. As, uh, as a teenager, but uh, I, I struggled with the maths. So I took a bit of a, a detour and did geography and geology A-levels and then went to work in industry mm. in uh, engineering drawing and drawing offices and um, I worked there for a number of years and then took a career break and went to Bible school right. uh, in South Wales, a small uh, Bible college, which is where I met my husband. He had just come out of uni and was on a gap year and went to Bible school and we met and got married the following year. And then um, after we'd been married uh, four years, um, we were blessed with our firstborn child, yeah. um, Josh, who's now 27. And when he was one, we went to Zambia for two years um, wow. working in overseas missions. Wow. Um, yeah, so that was a wonderful time in our lives. Mm. that's amazing but also uh, I'm sure all the listeners as well are thinking well that's quite a thing to do yeah. uh, when you've just had a child uh, yeah. what was it that, that spurred you on for that did you feel a, a kind of real sense of calling there and, and what was the stuff that you were involved in how did you and why did you end up going from presumably what was quite a comfortable situation yes. to something that was completely different yeah on our first date, on our very first date, we had this conversation about what we really wanted with our lives. Were material things uh, going to be our priority or if God um, um, prompted us to do things that seemed a bit <laughs> unusual or a bit brave or full of faith, even in a, a foreign country, Glenn particularly had a desire for going overseas and I had a, a great interest in doing the same. I nearly went as a single person and, and then had a slight change of direction. But um, we had the same value and interest in that. So um, Glenn had done an agriculture degree in Aberystwyth University. Right. And we uh, heard about an opportunity to go to Zambia, which was a Bible school and a uh, farm project. And Glenn got a post there as an assistant farm manager. Wow. And we were both teaching in the Bible school and I was driving minibuses and helping with hospitality yeah. whilst also bringing up our little boy. So it was wow. a shared dream. It was a dream come true and, and the timing was right. But obviously you go into um, a, a country with a high rate of HIV and poverty. Sure. Um, and it wasn't without its risks, but we had the most fantastic two years mm. um, there. Yeah, really shaped us and stayed with us for the rest of our lives, really. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. A, a remarkable um, kind of coming together of your strengths of Bible college and yes. farming, like yeah. everything that I suppose your husband and you had studied, really. So it seemed like a perfect fit. Uh, yeah. How was it, you know, 
raising raising your son there, family life, those kinds of things. Was that were there unique challenges there that um, that you had to overcome and things like that? Or? Um, obviously, you um, overcome homesickness. Yeah, yeah. I sure. was homesick for a little while, um, and just living in a completely different culture. And you're aware of, um, you know, this year we've celebrated 75 years of the NHS. Yeah. And you're aware that when you're in a third world country, you haven't got that. Sure. And so you're aware of of those sort of challenges, just being careful with your health. We all had malaria and different things when we were there. But, wow. you know, um, on the whole, we're, we're very happy and healthy in those two years. But, yeah, there was significant challenges. We were very close to the Congo border mm-hmm. and we'd often hear fighting and gunshots and... Wow. Uh, we had things stolen from the veranda of our little tiny bungalow that we had. So it was scary at times, but um, also really wonderful. It really, I think, um, bedded in our, our deep faith and trust in God that sometimes you you, you know the theory in your head. Sure. Um, but then you can you can really see it um, rolled out in practice. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, uh, th- there's verses in in the Psalms about God keeping us safe, and um, you know, he he who dwells in the secret place will abide under God's shadow. And and when you hear gunfire all around you, and you hear, you hear people um, stealing your property, yeah. it's then that you actually say, Lord, I believe <laughs> that yeah. this verse is true for me right now. That yeah. you would just protect us for this for this uh, time. Yeah. While there's trouble around us, and um, it gives your faith legs, doesn't it? In it that does. Sense. It does it really give it legs, and you think this is what peace. I think this is what peace is because peace is something that you only can really experience when you're in the trouble and when sure. you when you're in the storm. Hmm. Um, peace is very tangible, then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. love it. Yeah. Really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, amazing. We're gonna stop for some more music now and uh, and talk more with Sarah right after this. You're listening to Cross Rhythms Plymouth, 96.3 FM, uh, in conversation here on Life Stories with Sarah Chaplin. Uh, Sarah, we've discussed various different sections of your life, um, but uh, I guess to try and bring it up to date to some extent, but uh, also I suppose a theme that's been there for many years, uh, you mentioned off air that you're really passionate about communicating truth. Mm. Uh, you've got a, a website that's called uh, truthtold.org.uk. Um, what is it about that statement about communicating truth that's so important to you um i think there are there are so many lies or mistruths or half truths out in the world uh, we we, t- we talked about social media a little while ago didn't we there are so many um things that are, are are not quite accurate and what i know for sure is that the bible god's word is is truth it's full of truth and jesus says these words about um you'll know the truth and that and the truth will set you free mm. And so I've loved, I've always loved communicating, communication, sure. uh, presenting, whether that's in my day job or doing talks at church or engaging with youngsters in a youth group or speaking with uh, people in a, a care home. I love communicating, mm-hmm. but there's nothing more wonderful than communicating truth, the sort of truth that um, frees you up and changes your life for the better. Mm. So I would say that would be my, my life's passion is communicating truth yeah, yeah. in lots of different contexts um even in conversations with friends I, I i hope i'm the sort of friend that communicates um truth truth that makes our lives better yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and i know you mentioned um that you've you've written some books uh, one of them being a book called pearls for the girls um does that play on some of those things as well about communicating truth to to girls and and things like that tell us a bit about that book and and some of the things there yeah it does um a number of years ago when i was a a minister's wife and a pastor's wife i for for a number of years i um ran a mother and toddler group and it wasn't really my particular forte sure it wasn't uh, i can't say that it's it's my life's calling to run a toddler group even though i've had (laughs) four children they've all been toddlers at one time but i decided to make this uh group uh, put my own stamp on it and to make it my own and to put heart and soul into it um and so what what i used to do is every week I would give the girls, the mums, and sometimes dads used to come. I'd give them a flyer with just a little snippet of truth, a thought for the day, maybe something that had been in the newspaper or on the news, or something that I'd been thinking or pondering. And I used to ask God on a Wednesday night or Wednesday afternoon, what shall I say tomorrow? 
and then I would sit down and, and write something and give them a, a flyer and they used to comment that they would put it on their fridge and, and read it and mm. read it again and read it again they used to comment that it often was quite um, timely and poignant for them. How did you know I was thinking that? Wow. And, uh, and so I began, I did that for several years, one a week. And uh, a couple of years later, a friend of mine who's a GP, she said, you should publish those in a book. Take wow. some of your favorites and put them in a book. And I said, no. She said, honestly, other people would like those simple everyday truths. Yeah, yeah. Make like a coffee table style book yeah, yeah. that you can you can give as a gift or leave hanging around. And um, here it is, Pearls for the Girls. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's 52 uh, thoughts, 52 thoughts uh, with beautiful artwork and design from yeah. a friend of mine, Mel Chadwick, who's an say, artist, the design illustrator. design looks awesome. The cover's yeah. so nice. The cover's really nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so she's uh, an illustrator in, in Cornwall, got a successful business. She gave her time and her, her efforts, and we worked on this together jointly, and we completed it during COVID times when wow. we had a little more time. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's nice to finish a project that you've that you've considered and yeah, started. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was our COVID project, and it seems to be being well received. Last week... Um, somebody ordered 10 copies and they're going to use it in a youth group um, that's got a, a, a number of girls, teenage girls, because they find that the the talks are great for conversation starters. Sure, sure. And very practical and very um, accessible for all ages, I guess. Yeah, so yeah, we're yeah. really pleased with, with to yeah. hear news like that. Yeah, no, I love it. It's yeah. really cool. It seems... Um, as you say, certainly very relevant and very like digestible in a, in a sense that just yeah. you, it's a snippet of something to kind of ponder. So it's as much the the things that it leaves those people with to think about, to grapple with, as it is the actual message itself. Would that be? Would that, that be yeah, that's right. Uh, and I've written it in a certain style that asks a lot of questions. Sure. So, for example, there's one in there that's called Lost. I talk about, have you ever lost anything? Lost your car keys, lost your mobile phone, <laughs> lost your marbles, you know, <laughs> lost your lost your rag, you know, uh, lost your temper. Have you ever lost anything? And Or have you experienced loss in your life? You know, the loss of purpose, loss of identity, loss of a loved one. You know, loss takes many different forms. So I ask lots of questions and, and you know, but sometimes in times of loss, we also find things hmm. um, during those times. I just ask questions and, and put put the ball in somebody else's court to as to how those questions might be answered. Yeah, but yeah. snippets of truth packaged in everyday scenarios um, suitable for everyone. And that's from my heart, I guess. But that, that's how it came about. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Right. Good. We're going to uh, talk more with Sarah after this. You're listening to Life Stories here on Cross Rhythms Plymouth, and I'm in conversation with Sarah Chaplin. Uh, it's actually the second to last section of the interview, which has gone uh, so quick as they always do. So if you're just joining us now, well, go back, uh, check out the website crossrhythms.co.uk slash Plymouth, or find our YouTube channel Cross Rhythms Plymouth or at CR Plymouth on there, uh, and you'll be able to find the interview uh, very, very soon when we get it up there, and you can listen to it at your leisure. So talking with Sarah Chaplin and... Um, We've discussed a little bit about, you said that you're really passionate about communicating truth, mm. uh, communicating truth and, and real deep values, I suppose, that go mm. with that to people. It's a really interesting one, um, particularly now in the times that we're living in. You know, truth as a concept is something that sort of feels like it's being wrestled with by society. It feels like yeah. truth is kind of relative uh, to some mm. people. You know, their perception is that we're sort of post-truth is a phrase mm. that you hear nowadays. Um, and, you know, I think most people would would uh, say that the truth about a situation is good, but truth on a bigger level, is there any truth? And obviously, as Christians, that's something that we wrestle with. Is mm. that something that you have always found deep value in that concept or more so now? Because obviously it does feel like now, fake news, post-truth, all that stuff, it feels more relevant than ever, really. Mm. I, I think I've always... I've always held tight to the truth because it's been like a, a rock to me through my life. Sure. But but I, I think if ever we needed uh, truth, it's it's now because yeah. um, we, we don't know who to believe anymore yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And, um, 
you know, we've seen political turmoil, haven't we, the last few years and social turmoil and and things that we can't make sense of and, and who do we trust? Yeah, yeah. Who do we believe? Who do who do we um put our allegiance with yeah. and, and and I just find as a Christian uh, it's tried and tested for me that my my hope and and trust in God and and his truth yeah um, it, it literally it, it, it literally has transformed my life and my thinking and I, I I try and measure things up according to what God says in in his Bible because if we believe that's truth that's my that's my benchmark that's my measuring rod how does it how does it match with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's interesting as well because it's, you know, obviously that's, that's uh, to use that phrase deliberately, that is your truth. Your truth yeah. is that the truth of God, as you put it, yeah. has been true for you, has been uh, relevant through seasons. It stood the test of time. It's 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 stood up uh, through that. But it's not only just you, is it? You know, it's thousands of people, millions of people on the planet at the moment yes. align themselves to that truth in one way or another and have done through generations you know you mentioned the times that we are living in have lived through you know covid yeah. all kinds of political stuff mm. uh in a sense nothing's new under the sun it's not like no. there hasn't been uh disease before there's been pandemics before mm. there's been political turmoil before but mm. the truth of christ has if you look at it through history has stood up for for many many people all across the globe so it's a yeah it's a profound thing isn't it it stood the test of time yeah and, and i've had the privilege over my lifetime to visit lots of different countries lots of different cultures traveled quite a lot and i've seen christians throughout the world with the same values as me mm. in i've been in mud huts and i've been in um high-rise gold-plated uh, skyscrapers in Seoul and I still see the same faith that radiates from people's hearts and lives and yeah, it's inspiring. Yeah. Another thing that goes with truth as well is um, is kind of honesty in the sense of uh, being real with, with our own journeys, mm. with our own thing. You know, um, it is important that we're, we're really true to ourselves in that sense but also true to God. I think there's something that is vital in our lives that sometimes we can if we do things the way of the world we want mm. to hide we want mm. to hide our weaknesses we want to hide our vulnerabilities but yeah. but truth in a personal sense is really vital and letting that kind of meet god's truth is is key isn't it exactly and truth in in, in the sense of being a christian allows for our vulnerabilities and our weakness sure, sure. so so i we're not claiming to be perfect we're just claiming to be transparent before god and let his truth shine in our lives and through our lives and yeah. i i guess that would be my life's ambition that his light and his truth would somehow radiate through me mm, in good stuff. whatever setting i'm in yeah absolutely i mean we're uh running low on time on this section i, I we will get you to read a, a section from the book we'll probably do it in the next section now but uh if you listen to this and kind of really interested in what sarah is saying her website is truthtold.org.uk very aptly uh, to the conversation uh, so do check that out and uh, we'll come back with uh, Sarah for a section from her book and and some of those things that she's passionate about talking about uh, after this you're listening to Cross Rhythms Plymouth 96.3 FM final section of life stories here and as mentioned you'll be able to pick this up on our website and on our YouTube as well and uh, we've been talking with Sarah uh, Chaplin uh, about a number of things uh, one of the things that you're passionate about is is communicating truth and you've done that through little slices of truth and kind of thought for the day type things uh, through your book so tell us again what this book's called and uh, and we're gonna hear a section of it from you as well yeah sure it's called pearls for the girls um, and it's 52 thoughts for the days um, with some lovely artwork and il illustrations by a friend of mine Mel Chadwick um, yeah I'm gonna read one to you now that's called valleys my homeland of Wales is famous for its many hills and valleys that fill the landscape Sometimes they're steep-sided with deep, dark gorges, and sometimes they're broad, fertile plains, often with a river running through. But a valley always leads you somewhere, and most times will take you to the sea. Some valleys are notoriously a depressed, low-lying area or a wet marshland, both places where you could really get bogged down. Do you feel in a dip at the minute? Do you feel in a valley of some sort today? Psalm 23 is one of the most famous psalms in the whole Bible. And it says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It talks about walking through the valley. That's really interesting to me. It really is a passing through place. There is a beginning and an end to it, and valleys generally lead to significant places. Whatever your valley is called today, hold tight. Do not fear. You are just passing through. Mm. Amazing. Love it. Really, really love that. It's uh, beautiful. And as you say, the book there has loads of those types of things. Uh, amazing things that people can connect with. Do you want to just hold that up to the cameras? Now, this is obviously for people who are listening on the radio. You'll have to check this out on YouTube. But the yeah. uh, the illustrations uh, that go with it really are stunning and uh, really emphasise. Yeah, really emphasise the point there. Um, so, you know, the thing about truth we talked about it in the last section and, and really emphasise there is in in faith. Uh, there's the opportunity to be really vulnerable to be really Mm. open you know if you are going through that valley situation Mm. to bring that to to friends is one thing but to be able to bring that to god who already knows that uh the truth of that you know sharing your truth of that is is powerful and letting him and his truth meet you there uh is an awesome thing so um we've got a little bit a little bit more time uh here as well sarah and uh We'll, we'll just talk about something extra that you've done and we've got like two minutes to do it so it's a bit of a bit tight but uh, one of the other things you've done in your life is, is work as a hospital chaplain yeah um so how did that come about and, and how long was that uh, in your life um well that actually began when i was going through a really dark valley myself right uh, my mum was a cancer patient in the royal cornwall hospital in truro and we got a visit from a hospital chaplain uh, so this was 13 12 12 years ago Um, And we got a visit one day from a hospital chaplain. Uh, It was on a day when my mum was told she was terminally ill. And Mm. so we had prayers with this wonderful hospital chaplain because of the faith in our family that was important to us. And I just had a a moment, like an epiphany moment, where I wondered if one day I might be able to do a role like that. I had uh, pastoral experience, been a pastor's wife for 20 years, a theological qualification. And so... 18 months later, I began as a volunteer um, and uh, I've been in my role for almost 10 years now as a part time. I work three days a week, hospital chaplain, bringing spiritual and pastoral care to patients and families and staff. But it began through my own valley. So um, sometimes valley experiences and the dark times can bring for us real diamonds out out of the dirt, you know. Totally. And so uh, whoever would have thought that one of the bleakest moments of my life would would bring something that I hope and pray has brought a lot of light and hope and Mm. truth and truth at the bedside to to hundreds of people yeah and it it must be um quite a remarkable place for truth in that sense and for truth and vulnerable and honest conversations because at that stage whatever you're going through when you're in hospital you know I suppose all the distractions, all of the other stuff of life, bravado, yeah. all the pretense is kind of gone, hasn't it? So I yeah, imagine absolutely. it's quite a remarkable place for those. Absolutely. And people have open hearts to, they, they ask questions, they are, ask the big questions of, of life and mortality and, and even death. Sure. Uh, but, but even our colleagues, um, chief executive and the executive board of our hospital, even during COVID, in the uh, um, planning meetings and the major incident meetings every morning, those meetings were were asked to be concluded with the, quote, wise and inspirational words of a chaplain. So even Mm. in those morning meetings, we brought a thought for the day. And I used to love doing that. Um, Just bringing a little nugget of truth. So that was very loosely uh, Christian and um, from the heart, but it made all the difference as we began our day as we worked through a pandemic. So truth, truth can be packaged and presented in so many different ways but yes i would say um particularly patients they they ask lots of questions and you can when you when they ask a question uh, my role is to endeavor to bring hope and bring truth and bring comfort bring strength and bring peace it's a fantastic role yeah i can imagine very last question then very practical one uh where can people get their hands on on your book there and i know you've written another book which we haven't had time to talk about but where can people find out more uh, and get that book information will shortly be available on my website um the pearls for the girls book is on the website um i will leave you some contact details with an email address Mm. i've got an online shop with shopify where products are available there um i would 
delighted to hear from any listeners if they wanted to drop me a line and if yeah. anything I've said today has uh, resonated in some way uh, just get in touch perfect um, yeah yeah good stuff well, you can get in touch with us at the station if you're listening and thinking how do I do that well we're on uh, Facebook and Twitter at CR Plymouth connect with us there email info at crplymouth.co.uk uh, crossrhythms.co.uk slash Plymouth is our uh, website so uh, you can connect with us and we can connect you with Sarah as well so Sarah thank you so much for your time it's been a pleasure speaking with you thank you Dave